Philippians and chapter number 1 and verses 19 to 21. Now, our theme for today is and has to do with something on the uncertainty that we deal with in this fallen world. Paul, in this context, is imprisoned. He has been put in prison. We know of the story. This is a story we have considered over and over again. And we know that Paul, at this particular time in history, is awaiting his trial. The future is bleak for him. He is dealing with a frowning providence. And the outcome of the trial is uncertain. He does not know whether Caesar will say that he is to be freed. He does not know whether Caesar will say that he is to be convicted and sentenced to death. That is not clear to the Apostle Paul. But he is in prison. So he is a man that is faced with the reality of uncertainty. Yet, in that very context, I want us to see the confidence the apostle has, despite the uncertainty as to whether he will be freed from prison or, or rather he will be convicted and sentenced to death. What marks the life of the apostle Paul? What is it that would tell us of something of his response towards such uncertainty? Because in our context, we could be sympathizing with the apostle Paul because we're never faced with such frowning providence or bleak future or something to do with uncertainty, our reaction is always to despair or to panic or even to be afraid or to be anxious or to be worried. We don't know what the future holds for you, so how do you respond? How do you react? You despair, you are afraid, you are anxious, you are worried. And this is our response as human beings. You may have seen someone who is waiting uh, for someone who has been taken, you know, drawn to the theater. They pace in the corridors. You barely can sit as your loved one is in the theater waiting to be operated upon. Do you have the strength even to sit down, even to eat? Those who have admitted someone in the hospital. You have seen people who have taken their results to the lab, or they are waiting for the results from the lab. How do they respond? They're anxious, isn't it? They don't know what the results would be. This is a problem. Our reaction is always to be, you know, to be worried, to panic, to be, to, be, to, be, to be anxious, to be afraid. This is what's facing this man, the apostle, because he's not sure as to whether Caesar will free him or will convict him and sentence him. But you're going to see that despite that, that the future is bleak, the apostle Paul has confidence now, look at his confidence, for example, because we are looking at verses 19 to 21. I want you to just slowly with me appreciate the confidence that he has as he awaits the outcome of his trial. We know from hindsight, from the benefit as readers, that later on, Caesar sentences him and convicts him and he's dead, isn't it? He's killed. For now, he doesn't know, just like Job. So let's see. Despite the fact that it has not been you know, uh, determined, look how his response from verse number 19. Probably pick it from verse 18 in the middle there. He says, yes, and I will rejoice. Why? For I know. I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this, that is the trial, will turn out for my deliverance. Doesn't stop there. As it is my eager expectation, strong words, and hope that I will not at all be ashamed but that with full courage, those are words, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. 
what confidence this man has. He's, in, he's not sure whether he will be dead or alive in a couple of days or months or, or years. But he says, there are certain things I know. There's confidence I have. So he says, I know, in verse number 19, I'm not thinking, I'm not wishing it, I know that through your prayers, the saints at Philippi, and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. doesn't stop there. As it is my eager expectation. Look at that strong word. It is my eager expectation, doesn't stop there, and hope that I will not at all be ashamed. <laughs> is that confidence? I'll not be ashamed. But that with full courage, now, as always, okay? <laughs> this is the trend. With full courage, as always, it has always been the case, Christ will be honored in my body. Even when death takes, death, death takes place, when it is, I'm sentenced and I die, whether they tell me I'm freed, I know that Christ has always been glorified in my body. So I'll be glorifying Christ whether through death or life. It doesn't matter for him. What he knows is that ultimately Christ will be honored. Brothers and sisters, isn't that confidence? Look at verse 21. What about if he dies? Okay, he's, he's not sure whether he'll be freed. What about if he dies? Verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is It doesn't matter whether they kill me or they free me. I'm not losing anything, isn't it? Look at his attitude in verse number 23. 23. I am hard pressed between the two, whether to live or to die. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Is this man afraid of death? No. Facing uncertainty with confidence is our subject for today. How do you face uncertainty with confidence? Like the Apostle Paul asked in our context today, it could be that you, just like me, because we have a frail body, we admit it, or we are sick. It could be that we are struggling with an ailment that is chronic or even terminal. How do we approach such a situation as a Christian is the point we're dealing with. How do you face that? It comes to you. At some point in life, it will come. At some point in your life, you will face death. It may not be soon, but it will come. Because we are mortal. Ultimately, we are going to leave this world, isn't it? We need to face reality, brothers and sisters. Should, not, should we not face reality? It is coming at some point. A time comes when the body will become weak and weary. Because it's facing the grave. A time comes when we lose things that we value. For these people, persecution was facing them. They never knew whether they will succumb to persecution, whether they will be killed. They never knew. But how did they respond? And how should we respond? That is our subject for today. Let's observe the response of the apostles so that we get encouragement. How does it respond? First of all, in verses number 19 and up to verse number 20, we have seen that the Apostle Paul has confidence to face difficulty. Still, death is not mentioned. He's not sure that he's going to die, but he knows that he's in difficulty. How do you face difficulty? It has not come to death. Death will be in verse number 20, 21. Just difficulty, like the Apostle Paul. For him, it is imprisonment. How does he face it? Let's begin reading from verse number 19. He says, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Look at the confidence of this man. He knows the God who has given us the means of prayer. Prayer is a means that God has ordained to accomplish his purposes. So he knows that if the saints kneel down in contrition to pray for him, God will hear them. 
himself has prayed. He, he saw it in verse number 9. With full confidence. So he knows that the God who has ordained prayer as a means by which he accomplishes his purposes will hear the prayer of the saints and answer those prayers when he suffers. Now, you know, the Apostle Paul is this man that uh, lives what he preaches. He believes in prayer. And he says prayer will work because the efficacy of prayer is not on the prayer itself, but the one to whom we pray. We pray to God who is the God of all, the God who can accomplish all. He uses prayer to accomplish his purposes. He can use prayer in our situations. He glorifies himself through prayers. Now, later on, the same apostle shows Something of this to the Philippians. He shows them. He is confident about the power of prayer. The results of the prayer. The efficacy of the prayer. The prayers will work. Look at what, again, he tells his, these people in chapter number 4. About prayer. In verse number 4. The Apostle Paul is not anxious. In his difficulty. He is not worried. He is not fearful. He tells them, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, this will turn out for my deliverance. He's sure. I know. Now, that is his attitude. That is his posture as he approaches suffering. The same, same things he tells this church later on because he preaches what he does, what he practices. Chapter 4 and verse number 4. He tells them, rejoice in the Lord. Because we saw in chapter 1 verse 29 that the same church was also suffering. So he tells them, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. How can we rejoice in trouble? First of all, what are you saying? That I should rejoice in my trouble. Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? Don't you know the troubles of the world? Tell them, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. I'm repeating myself so that you get me clear, okay? What did I say? Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious. About anything, anything, but in everything, not some things, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. The result is verse 7. And the peace of God in that tumultuous moment, in that trouble, in that difficulty, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. In Jesus Christ. Certainty that God answers prayers. Certainty of the effectiveness of prayers. The Apostle Paul. What confidence? Where is our confidence? Prayer. He knows the God of the prayer. It doesn't stop there. Verse number 19, chapter 1. It says, for I know. I'm not thinking. I'm not gazing. For I know that through your prayers... And the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. The Spirit, the help that comes through the Spirit at a time when we are weary, when we are in difficulty, when things don't seem to work. Who do we rely upon when you are troubled? Is it not the Spirit? The Spirit. And that's why Christ tells the disciples, Please, wait for the Spirit. <laughs> Just wait for Him. He'll come. Before you embark on anything, wait for Him. The Samson Spirit will give you words to speak when you're brought before courts. Again, Romans, the book of Romans is written against the background of suffering. Look at chapter 8 now, Romans. That you see the same consistency you're seeing here in Philippians. Quickly, Romans and chapter 8. Let's see that the same same spirit is mentioned. We have realized that his, Paul says in Philippians chapter 1 verse 19, he is calling him the spirit of Jesus Christ. Very important. Romans chapter number 8. The same words are used. The same context. Verse number 9. Romans 8 verse number 9. So that you see that the spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit is also referred to as the Spirit of Christ. Verse number 9, chapter 8 of Romans. You, however, are not in the flesh, 
but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit dwells in you. Or if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. So it's called the spirit. Again, the same verse, the spirit of God dwells in you. The next sentence, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. The same word, the same verse, three ways to refer to the spirit. The spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ. The same person. Now look at his work in suffering. Back, just go down to verse number 18. You see that the context is suffering. Verse number 18, Romans 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So the context is suffering. Now, verse 26. The work of the Spirit in suffering. In that moment, in suffering, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Time of suffering. Why? For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words at a time of suffering. How do you pray when you're suffering? You don't know. I don't know how to pray. Should I pray for healing? <laughs> Isn't it? Because I don't know God's will. So it says, in that particular case, the Spirit helps us in our weakness because we do not know how to pray when faced with suffering. Get the point? Could be thinking, should I pray for the healing of this brother? Should I pray that God, how do I pray? That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He comes and prays aright. Because his will is God's will. Continue reading so that you see. The same, same verse. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we watch, but the Spirit intercedes himself in the seeds for us, with groanings to for words, verse 27, and he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of what? The spirit. What is the confidence of a Christian in suffering? The ministry of the Holy Spirit. No wonder we need him, isn't it? No wonder Christ says, you'll be baptized, you'll receive the blessing of the Spirit. So that he will intervene for you and me in the context when I don't know what to pray, even when faced with difficulty. Paul is sure. He says, I am sure that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, this providence here that is frowning will turn off for my deliverance. He's certain about it because of the effectiveness of prayer and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We have to proceed, brothers, back to Philippians. Still in verse number 19. The second thing he's sure about in his difficulty is this, that God will not allow him to be put to shame. All right? Let's read verse number 19 again. He says, yes, I will rejoice because I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this trial here will turn out for my deliverance, verse 20, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed. God, in whom we trust, will never abandon his beloved at a time of trouble. Did God abandon Jesus Christ when he was suffering? No. The Bible says when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Father himself sent the angels to minister to him. He did. Paul is sure. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What did they tell the king? Oh, <laughs> long live the king. Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. May it be known, however, to you that you can, you know, hurl us into the furnace, fiery as it is. But we have a God, that God is able to deliver us from the furnace. But be sure this, about this, even if it does not, we will not bow to your God. 
the God you're talking about has never abandoned his beloved at a time of trouble. He cannot allow them to be put to shame because his name is at stake. Get the point? It is his reputation. What would people have said in a foreign land in Babylon that the people who worship the God of Israelites were thrown into prison, they were thrown into furnace, they were thrown into the den of the lions, and they are consumed. What would people have said about that God? He has no power, isn't it? Hey, hey, Paul is sure. That God that I'm talking about will not put me to shame. Now, shame in the Bible means not being disappointed. That's the point. He will not disappoint. God does not disappoint his people at a time of trouble. He will never abandon us when faced with difficulty. Never. Paul says, I'm sure about this. It does not matter whether I'm going to die or I'm going to live, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, even if you kill us, it's okay. But we are sure about the God we're talking about. Do you see the confidence this man has in time of difficulty? He has confidence in his God. Brothers, as you look at Paul, begin to scan around our lives and see that rather than fear, rather than worry, rather than anxiety, trusting in God is what we need at a time of trouble. Trusting him is much prayer and the help of the Spirit. That is what we need. We need to go back to that God. He will ultimately vindicate his own children in the time of trouble. It is the same God who vindicates Christ Jesus of Nazareth. The man who people said, crucify him, crucify him. They hated him. They rejected him until it was said that he's a criminal. In fact, they crucified him regarding him as a criminal. People went home knowing that that person who was killed, the, the, the Jesus of Nazareth, was a criminal. Wait until the third day. He vindicates his own son. Isn't it? Yeah. He rises from the dead. He has never abandoned his people. He has never put them to shame. The integrity of our God. But something, something else, brothers. Thirdly, what confidence do we have when faced the trouble? Paul says in third place, still in verse number 20, he says, as it is my eager expectation and hope, very strong words, that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, strong words, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body whether by life or by death. He's saying that God allows those situations in our lives, the difficulties for the glory and honor of Christ. Again, Romans chapter 8. Remember verse 28 now? All things work together for good. Makes sense now. Yeah. Christ will receive the honor in my suffering. That's the point. Whether I die or I live, Christ that I am serving, the Christ that I'm faithful to will be honored even in trouble, in my struggles, in my suffering, in my affliction, that Christ will be honored. What an confidence this man has in that Christ. Now, that word honor that has been used there is the word magnify. Those of you who have used a magnifying lens to see, observe very small details of things, that's the word used here. That Christ will be magnified or made great. So he says, my suffering will serve to magnify Christ. What does suffering, for example, magnify about Christ Jesus? Is this not his grace? What does Apostle Paul say? That in my weakness, I am, when I'm weak, I'm strong, isn't it? Because it is when I'm weak that his grace is sufficient. for me. People see his grace. It is at such a time when we are faced with difficulty, that the grace of Christ is magnified. People see that surely God is gracious, that they just live knowing that their salvation is based on Christ, his merits on the cross, his righteousness alone, that even when they are walking on earth like we do, as we saw John here, we live by grace. It's a life whose foundation is grace, a life Sustained by grace. 
That's the part. People begin to see the grace of Christ in our suffering. Because they ask the question, how can he be calm? How is he not anxious? Why is it not that he's not anxious and worried and fearful, yet he's suffering? People will ask the question, isn't it? What is, is it that he's stoic? He's indifferent, no? We feel the pain. We cry. Don't you cry like me? In pain? Yet, we cry with confidence. So people ask, look at us Christians. Why is it that they seem not to be disillusioned? They are not as dis disparate and, and depressed as us. Even in these economic times. Not that the Christians don't feel the weight. They feel the weight, but they know where to take the weight. And they know how to respond to the weight. And so they ask the question, why are the Christians different? They're different because they understand of something of the graciousness of Christ even at a time of trouble. They know that God is with me. Isn't it? In this one, and my God is with me. And so later on, the Apostle Paul is saying the same letter. That I know how to be brought low and brought high, isn't it? To live in abundance and in little, isn't it? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Who strengthens when there is need? Christ. The verse is not, does not mean that you can play basketball and win. Alright? It means whether in difficulty or in abundance, in all circumstances in life, because of Christ and his strength that he gives, you can travel and do everything. You can live in difficulty. The Apostle Paul is living in difficulty here, isn't it? And he's confident. Why? How? How do you explain this? Christ and his grace. Brothers and sisters, we are talking about facing uncertainty with confidence in the God we serve. We have seen that in verses 19 and 20, Paul faces the future, the uncertainty, what is yet to even understand with confidence. He's not worried about the results. But in the second place, let's see his confidence when he's facing death in verse number 21. First of all, in difficulty. The second place, when the Apostle Paul is facing death. Because Caesar can say that he's been sentenced and convicted and he's killed. What happens in that case? He says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Confidence when facing death as a Christian. Brothers and sisters, these words can only be pronounced by a Christian, isn't it? <laughs> because it is the Christian with confidence. Because they have of something of the encouragement that they receive from their fellowship and relationship and union with Christ. We have been united inseparably with Christ. So that Paul later on, back to Romans 8, will say that not even death can separate us from who? The love of God in Christ, isn't it? Not even death. Paul says here, for me to live is... Christ dies gain because gain is the being with Christ immediately I die. Death does not separate me from Christ. It draws me near to him. Verse 23. Beginning verse 22. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. Verse 23. I am hard pressed to make a choice between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. How can you say that, that your desire is to die? You can only say that if you have confidence, isn't it? That the place you're going to is better. I mean, if you're not sure about heaven, if you're not sure about being with Christ, death through is a dread, it's a terror. You resist death. There are two people who respond to death, probably three. One is a person who, it is not that they love death, but they have given up. Out of depression, we've seen people killing themselves because of depression, isn't it? They have lost hope. 
Leave alone that person. They are not dying because they love death. <laughs> they are lying because they have no hope. They have no future. But there's this person who, he, he says, look at the words in verse 23. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire, what delights my soul is to die. Hey! Because that is far better than being alive. Because he's sure that immediately he dies, he goes to the presence of Christ Jesus. And he says, you cannot compare the presence of Christ, being with Christ, to being alive in the world. Those are two things you cannot compare. He chooses the great one. The great one is here, being with Christ. Because he knows. Being with Christ being, is being relieved from the pain of the world. The fullness of the world. The suffering of the world. And to enjoy the fellowship that is uninterrupted with Christ forever. When he goes to be with him. This is the apex of joy. And so, back to verse number 18. You can now understand why Paul says, I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. In verse number 18. Because he knows the good that comes even with death. Death brings good. It brings gain. Not loss. Here on earth, when one dies, our loved one, when they die, we consider it at loss. In fact, we tell one another, sorry for your loss. Isn't it? Brother, sorry for your loss. For Paul says, don't say sorry for your loss. Say it is a gain. Because the person has gone with Christ. For him, it's not a loss. Yes, you tell them sorry. Please tell me sorry when I'm bereaved. Tell my wife sorry when she's bereaved. But it is not loss, it is gain. Because this person goes with Christ. Where else would you want to be? Apart from being with Christ. What delights your soul? Which is the perfect place to be with? Which is the blessed place? Which is the holy place to be with in eternity? If not being with Christ. I hope that you begin to see that you should not fear death as a Christian, isn't it? <laughs> it is coming, okay? <laughs> it is coming to me. It is coming to you. But how do you approach it? Confidence. God has promised that immediately the saints die, there is no purgatory. That we somehow hope that we will gather in this hall and make some weird prayers. Mary, the mother of the Lord, please pray for us. Okay? So that somehow the souls would jump like atoms and molecules from purgatory to heaven. Please, if you believe in purgatory, you have no hope and confidence. Don't talk about confidence, okay? Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. Because death is merely a translation. The Catholics create the third option to encourage themselves, isn't it? That's a weak encouragement, brothers. <laughs> that you're somewhere in the middle, okay? <laughs> you're in the middle between hell and heaven. So somewhere, some middle there. You can somehow oscillate and jump out. That's not hope. The hope here is that when a Christian sleeps, the word used, they go to with Christ immediately. And so you hear Christ tell that the thief on the cross, the penitent one, tells them, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Today. You are not going to be purgatory. To, to be, to, to purgatory. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And so, it pleases him as the Lord of Lords to die first so that the person is received by him, isn't it? Surely, how can the person go ahead of Christ? Who receives him there? <laughs> Who receives the souls there? It's Christ, isn't it? So he dies and waits for him to come, isn't it? So the fellow comes. So Christ does ask by, surely he has to be the first person to receive him. You can imagine the joy that was on the face of that man when Christ was receiving him, isn't it? <laughs> wow, you said it. I heard you say it. It is true. <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, now I'm here. Then Christ tells him, probably, I have many more to bring here, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to be, on that day, be raised from the dead so that I bring many of such you here that they may rejoice with me. They may be with me. Where? Brothers, death 
to us is not loss, it is gain. Let's face it confidence. Let's grieve, let's cry, let's mourn, but in confidence. Because for us, it is being with Christ, which is the most beautiful, beautiful the most glorious place to be with. The Apostle Paul says, still in the same verse, as conclude. He says, verse 21, for to me, I mean, that's personal, isn't it? To me. <laughs> I don't care how you think about it, isn't it? <laughs> to me, Apostle Paul says, because of confidence. For to me, to live is Christ. That is gain. This is a personal thing, isn't it? A personal thing when it comes to exotology. Because it is me who dies, isn't it? I probably go ahead of you. So, yes, we have corporate hope, but we have personal hope. His hope and surety is that for me to live is Christ. In other words, I'm alive because of Christ, and I'm alive to serve Christ. That's the point. This is I'm alive, I'm telling you, I'm still alive because Christ gives me life. And because he has left me here, I may serve him. We look at that next Sunday. When he has given us little breath like we still have today, this borrowed life, please, let's live for him and serve him and glorify him. May it be said that when we live on earth, our life was such that it glorified Christ. That with full confidence, when faced by difficulty or death, we can have confidence in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You could be here. You're not a Christian. You begin to see that such hope can only be held by Christians. See the point? This is the time to think about yourself and your life. What about me? These people, you have given account on people who had such hope and confidence because they believe in Christ Jesus. For them, Christ was everything. That's the, that is the secret of life. The secret of life is Christ. If you are here, you are yet to see of the secret of life, the reason you should be alive, see this in the life of the Apostle Paul. Christ. Do you have a union with Christ our Lord? Do you have a fellowship with Christ our Savior? Has he saved you, drawn you to himself powerfully by his spirit? Has Christ been gracious to you? Can you hear his words, his voice in every line? Can you see his merits on the cross? Can you see the Apostle Paul says that I have, have, have looked at my life, I've scanned through whatever gain that I thought I had in this world, I consider it loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through law keeping, but the righteousness of God that comes through faith in Christ Jesus. Is that your hope? I invite you to look at Christ and consider him. To behold him, to look at him and plead with him and cry to him, Jesus Christ, if this is who you are, please, I desire you in my life. Please, I come with my sins. I bear them at the cross. Yeah. Receive me as that wretched sinner who has gone away from God, rebelled against God, and now you have drawn to yourself that you may clothe me with your righteousness and that alone. Those who go to Christ and plead for him, for the clothing with righteousness, he turns not away. He does so. When that thief on the cross told him, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom, what did he tell him? I assure you, okay? Amen, amen. Today, you will be in paradise. Can't you draw such encouragement and believe in Christ? Didn't you tell him no? What did you tell him? That I, I, I don't want? Please just go away? I have nothing to do with you? He told him, Amen, Amen, I tell you today, you'll be with me. Such is the Savior we are talking about today. That is the Savior we proclaim for you and to you. Please look at him, come to him, and plead with him for salvation as you repent of your sins. And the Lord bless you.